Um, so um, welcome to the cross-examination lecture. My name is Peter Suska. I'm a coach at Calvert Hall College High School. Um, previously before that, um, I was a coach at George Mason for a number of years while I was a grad student. And then I debated um, at a national level at the University of Mary Washington. And then I debated at a small school in Erie, Pennsylvania called Cathedral Preparatory School. So um, I have been doing debates for um, a fairly long time. Um, I'm not at the point where I've been doing debate longer than you have all been alive, but give another four years and I'm gonna be feel very, very, very old. Um, here, let me stop the share for a second to get rid of my Slack. Sorry about that. Okay. And let's go back. Okay, so um, this lecture is gonna be about cross-examination. Um, we're gonna talk about um, preparation for cross-examination. Um, cross-examination is not something you just walk in and do. Um, some people think it is, um, but it is something that you prepare beforehand. So um, something that you can do, um, certainly a, a, a 2N should prepare um, to do cross-examination in the 1AC before, before the round, um, and there should be some kind of forethought into it. But we're going to talk about pre-round prep, then we're going to do, go the, down the line of all of the different speeches and you know things you should think about when you're doing cross-examination, and then some, um, some just final thoughts. Um, I don't know if major key is still a thing that people talk about. Um, I'm kind of a little dated on, on pop culture references. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about when to dunk and not to dunk on your opponent in a cross-examination. So let's get started. Um, now, this is going to be um, tips both ways, okay? So asking and receiving. Um, I didn't demarcate them because a lot of the tips are um, beneficial for both sides, but um, I will talk about different things for both sides. So um, before the round, all right, whether you're affirmative or negative, you should know what your evidence says, all right? Um, two A's and one A's should know what their evidence says. Two A's should know, you know, what the un underlined portions of their cards say in the one AC. They should know what the articles in their one AC say, because sometimes um, there might be an alternative cause that you know the answer to, but you don't want to get popped on. Um, so you should know your evidence going into a debate. And the same thing is true for the negative as well. You should be looking at the affirmative before the debate starts. Now, sometimes um, you're not going to, they'll say it's new or um, they don't post their sites. So, you know, you really can't um, um, prepare for that. But a lot of times people are going to post their 1ACs. Uh, they'll at least post their sites on the wiki. So you have the ability to do that. And by know your evidence, I mean, you should be looking at specific piece of evidence pre-round if you were a negative of what are things that you wanna kind of cross-examine. The second thing is know your opponent, know your opponent. So if you are affirmative, it, what know your opponent is means is what are negative arguments they go for, right? Um, when you walk up into a round, um, you know, the affirmative discloses their AF, and then the NAG will disclose their politics DA, what their scenario is, they'll say what their past two and R's have been, and then you can check on the wiki. So you can get a pretty good grasp of what argument that they're going to be reading, and you can kind of focus in on that. So if they go for a set call critique, and that's what the last seven neg debates have been, you should be focusing on set call. You should be focusing in on their specific cards. And I'll talk about that um, during one in, the one and C section, but you should kind of know what your opponent is going to do. Um, at a certain point in the season, people kind of gravitate towards um, certain arguments that they like. So they might really enjoy politics. They might really enjoy the state's counter plan, um, but know your opponent before the round. And sometimes it can't be helped because they don't really have a wiki, but to the extent that you can, you can read their evidence, 
know your opponent. And then the last part is have a strategy, have a strategy. So what do I mean for that on the affirmative? On the affirmative, all right, it looks like um, we are um, just getting just about full. Cool. Welcome to everybody. You haven't missed much. This is just our first slide on what to do when um, preparing for cross X. So there are steps to prepare for cross X. So we talked about know your evidence. Um, and that's very important and knowing your opponent. The next one is to have a strategy, to have a strategy. So on the affirmative side of have a strategy, what that entails is you know the weaknesses to your affirmative. So, you know, um, if you, for example, read a KFOSAF um, that one of the labs produced, that was produced at a few other camps, you know what the weaknesses are. So have a strategy of how you're going to respond to questions about that weakness in the affirmative. If it's this like Lake Erie personhood AF, you know the flaws in that evidence. So you should prepare beforehand. What is your answer to it? If your affirmative has real difficulty with the state's counter plan, know that you're going to have to answer questions about the state's counter plan and kind of be prepared for that. If your advantage, you know, requires, you know, multiple internal links and there's one that's not super, super strong, know that that's going to be a question. A lot of times there'll be the same question over and over and over and over and over again. So for example, um, I assume that, I don't know, maybe a, a third of you probably read or debated the death penalty affirmative last year. Um, that's probably a pretty good assumption. So of the 20 death penalty debates I judged last year, um, I got something in the chat. Um, where do all these people go? Hmm. Um, of the like 20 death penalty debates that I judged last year, um, I would say I heard life without parole, LWAP in almost every single cross-examination. Um, and it's just an argument that people really, really loved, you know, um, life without, you know, life without parole also sucks. And that is a question that you can prepare that you have, you can have answers to. So have a strategy on the neg side. All right. And we'll get into this right now. Um, you are building a one NC. So have a strategy of what you want to do in the debate. So, um, we're going to go to the second bullet point first. All right. Um, we'll, we'll talk about dunking in a second. Okay. Um, so your goal in the 1AC cross X is typically to build your 1NC. Now you can, you can belittle and make fun of the 1AC advantages. A lot of times you're going to have to if you don't have, if it's new advantage and you have nothing against it. Um, like that's all you really can do until you find some ways to, to win the debate. But the entire goal of your cross X should be to build off case positions, to build off case positions. So for example, um, you were given the state's counter plan, you were given the privatization counter plan, which is like, there's an incentives counter plan in there. So you can read that and your whole goal is to attack their fed key warrant. Why the federal government is not key, why the states should do the affirmative, why um, federal money, why federal incentives are not key, why we should instead have a different incentive system, um, why we should let the private industry take over. So you can have questions based on looking at their evidence and ask questions about the solvency advocate about why it's terrible, why it's not mutually exclusive, why it's not um, solely the federal government's ability to do something, but have targeted questions so that you can build your state's counter plan. Build your state's counter plan. For disadvantages and critiques, you can do something similar. Um, you know, for critiques, oftentimes you're talking and you're attacking the historical uh, legitimacy of the argument. You know, when has um, the criminal justice system, going back to last year, when has the criminal justice system been beneficial towards a certain population? 
and try and kind of link them to a historical argument. Um, what for a disadvantaged argument, you know, asking arguments about inherency, asking inherency questions, oftentimes are reasons that end up becoming politics links because there's a political reason that the affirmative has not happened. So you can access a politics disadvantage from that. And then lastly too, you can have, um, you, you want to like, these, these plan texts are typically 17 words, 26 words, and they don't explain everything the affirmative does. If you think an affirmative is not topical, try to get them to explain in detail everything that they do. And then that way you can have a very easy and good explanation when you're going for topicality later on in the debate. Now let's go back to the first dot, okay? It says, resist the urge to dunk on your opponent, threes win rings. All right, I'm very invested in the NBA finals right now, so I apologize for the basketball analogies. What might um, resisting the urge to dunk on your opponent mean in the 1AC? What, 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 what might that mean? What, what, what might the context be? Feel free to throw it into the chat. Resist the urge to dunk on your opponent. Like try to build up your own arguments instead of trying to like embarrass them. Yeah, one hundred percent. And what is what's a what's a low hanging fruit question that you can typically always ask in a one AC cross X? Rams with rook or war. Um, so you can attack impact scenarios like when has this ever happened? Um, you have this economic scenario. We had a recession. We had COVID. You can ask COVID questions a lot, and those are important questions sometimes to build impact, to build impact defense, to build your case defense. If you're going for a DA versus case strategy, um, it's also super beneficial for if you want to establish a process counter plan. So like getting the timeline of an affirmative, um, when is the impact going to occur, attacking certainty key questions, th those are super important. But like asking the question like, has nuclear war ever happened are just terrible questions. Has this impact ever happened? When's warming going to happen? All of those are things that sure, you're going to make them like cringe a little bit and they're not going to be great at answering them. But in the long run, it doesn't benefit you as much as getting competition to your counter plan, um, establishing the difference between the affirmative and the, uh, the soon to be introduced counter plan or T or DA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, your goal should be building and having the judge understand what the one NC is going to be and the strategic benefits of the one AC. Now from the AFS perspective, all right, Typically, you'll you'll know this, right? You'll you'll your affirmative should have some built-in answers. It should have an argument about why the U.S. is key if you have a modeling advantage, Fed key warrants, um, an agent um, warrant um, if you are are worried about that, or um, a certainty key warrant. So you should have these drills. Um, I know some schools will do like a 20-minute cross-ex drill um, during their preseason to prepare. Um, their debaters for this. And that can be super useful for you all to kind of get ready for this because you're going to see the same questions over and over and over again. And sometimes you can tell what's happening. So like, you know, if you, if somebody asks a question, like I roll my eyes at this because I only judge policy debates, I'll judge like 10 K debates or um, um, clash debates a year. But like, if somebody's like, uh, what is death? What is, what is death to you? Like, you know, what's happening a hundred percent. You know what's going to occur. It's going to be, um, you know, some people are really into those debates. Some people are not. But you have a typical bet about what is going to be happening. So um, let's talk about the one and see. Okay. So this is the goal of the affirmative. All right. The goal of the affirmative. When you are going into a one NC cross examination. You're you're the one A. Your two A is scrambling to put up answers. Okay, your goal should be to eliminate off case positions. That your cross X is so devastating that your two A can spend ten seconds on it, fifteen seconds on it, and it completely goes away. All right, 
that is some that is one of your big goals when you're going into a cross examination. Um, you should always ask the status at the at the beginning, um, just so that you can identify conditionality or if they're going to be those weirdos that do dispo the one time. Um, obviously, you're going to be doing that, and then the majority of your um, one and C cross X should be done on making comparisons. Okay. So comparisons, comparisons, comparisons. So what do I mean by that? Well, comparisons are things you can do to establish deficits and perms against counter plans and critiques. So it can be a basic question. What's the key difference between the counter plan and the affirmative? And then get them to explain it so that you can understand a, um, you can start establishing a permutation. Um, if it's a state's counter plan, you can look at their evidence and you can start um, rolling through all of your Fed key warrants to see which of them they don't specifically answer. The same thing is true for critiques. Um, you can start I isolating and figuring out, is this a movements-based alternative? Is this an alternative that is based on epistemology? Is an, an, um, an alternative that is just to the debaters themselves? And you can start looking at deficits from there. And then also what's um, very important is sometimes people don't have the goods on your affirmative. So sometimes, you know, you debate a set call team or you debate an Afropest team and they don't have a card on, let's say cloud seeding, because like who has cards on cloud seeding? You can start looking and seeing, you know, where you can start getting some link defense that's there. All right. Now, the second thing you should be doing, all right, is highlight card quality. So you should be looking at evidence and kind of seeing where can you attack and where can you try and embarrass the, the negative so they have to read more evidence. This happens in politics a lot where, you know, they'll read a link card that just says water protections. Maybe it won't even say that and it'll say regulations on this topic. And it won't be specifically about the affirmative. If your 2A has link defense, link turns, right? That is a one-two punch. And it requires the one and R to read more link cards, which shaves part of the one and R where the, it should have been in the one and C. So you're making the block smaller by asking simple questions like that. And it makes the one ER a lot easier because the neg block is catching up on a problem in the one and C. So highlight card quality. That can be on uniqueness. Uniqueness is very easy to attack because a lot of times it, um, that uniqueness evidence will say the neg argument on one paragraph and then a paragraph after, you can go and look at the site and it'll say the exact opposite. Sometimes there'll be a bunch of thumpers. There'll be some non-unique arguments that are thrown into there. So highlighting card quality can be extremely, extremely useful. So comparisons, comparisons, comparisons for counterplans and critiques, and then highlighting card quality when it comes to all arguments so that you can also allow a judge to see these things, okay? Now we're gonna get into the judge at one point, but a lot of times these cross-examination arguments, uh, these cross-examination questions are for the benefit of the judge, okay? Can you please clarify the status? Yeah, the stat, okay. The status is, um, a status question is what is the status of the counter plans? Um, so I believe there's some conditionality lectures. Um, I think Miles just like destroyed conditionality for an hour um, last, last lecture. Um, but it, status questions are under what conditions can you kick the counter plan? So are, are, uh, is the negative stuck with the counter plan for the entire debate or can they kick the counter plan whenever, which is conditionality. Um, dispositionality um, quickly is just, you can kick it whenever unless the affirmative reads offense against it. What is offense depends on who the debater is. You know, um, neg teams will say, um, you know, it's straight turns. AF teams will say it's perms or offense. Um, it, really, it really just depends on what their specific um, definition of it is. And you ask that question, um, so that you can read conditionality, which is going to be an extremely important theory argument. Um, AFs should always have it because NEGs will read two to four off um, of conditional advocacies, counterplans, critiques. And a lot of times it's the only argument you're going to have 
if you're getting absolutely demolished. Uh, but good question. Okay. So these are the easiest cross X's, right? The one AC, um, you have time before round to kind of ask questions. The one NC, you know, you can focus in on something specific that you know you have trouble with. Um, after, you know, a tournament or two, if there's something that you got beat on a bunch, you can focus in on that and, you know, know that that's the cross X that you should be focusing, focusing in on. Um, the next is the 2AC, all right? 2AC cross X. So um, this is probably the toughest um, and most boring cross X for a judge and for a debater to give is the 2AC cross X. Um, Cause it's like, what do you do um, as a one N? What do you, do you back up your two N? Do you back up the one NR? Um, do you ask three minutes of questions on one position and give it away? I mean, it really, really depends. It's really, really tough for me. All right. And this is uh, my opinion. Um, I'm sure um, there's a good amount of people that share this. Um, I think the best thing to do when you're neg is to build the one in R, is to build the one in R. So you want to high, um, all right, I should have written highlight evidence, not high evidence, sorry. Um, highlight evidence, compare things. So like if your one in R is going to be T, um, spend the entire cross X going through their interpretation, um, their counter interpretation, attack their we meet card, start establishing and asking for a bright line of what affirmatives meet the affirmatives um, counter interpretation against topicality and start, you know, getting that in order so that you can have a better one in R and you also have the benefit of the judge having a little bit more information. I would say isolate on a singular position. Um, you can, you know, if it's politics, you can just attack their politics um, evidence for three minutes. If it's a specific counter plan that you're doing, if there is an argument that you're two end, if it's impact turns, spend the entire time on impact turns. Um, there should be a conversation with um, your two end before the round of, you know, what should I be taking? And then also right before two AC ends, you know, what, what should I take? Sometimes your two end won't have the answer, but you'll have a general gist of what you're taking and then you can focus in on that. But it does require a conversation with your partner pre-round before the 2AC. Um, you typically should not be asking your 2N, what should the 1NR be right at the end, uh, right at the start of 2NC prep. So with that being the case, the, the last thing you should do is back your 2N up. Back your 2N up. So if there is something that they need so like if they're having issues, if, if they're extending a disadvantage, if they're extending T, um, you can ask questions to kind of back them up so that they have some explanation and they uh, of something that they need. So for example, you know, if it's an add-on um, that's thrown into the 2AC, as they're grabbing answers to the add-on, you can start attacking it so that they, while you're giving the cross X, um, can come up with some arguments and can help that out. So you should also back up your 2N. I, this is like one of the few times where I think it's okay to flow check people too, so that your 2N is not wasting 2NC prep. Um, because you're, while you're asking questions, you should always, your, your, your partner should always be preparing for the next speech. They should always be preparing for the next speech. So on the AF side, um, I, I mean, I, I haven't done this in a while, um, but it's really hard to guess what the neg block is going to be based off the cross examination. You should basically just kind of um, make sure that as many of your two AC arguments survive the two AC as possible, and then you know if you can kind of glean what the neg is focusing in on. That's something you can tell your one A. Like, listen, the one in R is going to be this. It's going to be politics. It's going to be T. You should start looking at that a little bit. But a lot of times your whole goal in the 2AC as the AF debater is to keep as many of your 2AC cards, your 2AC arguments alive um, because your 1A should typically not be doing anything in 2AC cross-ex of answering questions. Your 1A should either be doing one 
um, shadow flowing, uh, sorry, back flowing you, which is creating a flow for you so that you have a, a record of what's happened in the 2AC, or they should be preparing for the 1AR. Even, even in the 2AC cross X, um, I would often, when I debated, I was a 1A2N, I would have three to like five of my 2AC arguments already extended on my flow during 2AC cross X. Um, and sometimes it would be redundant, but most of the times, like I would say nine out of 10 times, I would predict it correctly and um, would be able to make my 1ARs a lot more efficient, use less prep by the 1A preparing for the 1AR during 2AC cross X, during 2AC cross X. So um, with that being said, all right, we're gonna move to our last um, speech and then I'll have some final kind of um, things to think about as you're doing cross-examination and I'll end the record so we can do like kind of a Q&A. So um, the 2NC, the 2NC. So what should a 2A be doing during the 2NC cross-ex? I am a big fan of for um, thinking ahead. So that's why I started this lecture talking about pre-round of thinking about the end of the debate. And you should be doing the same thing during the 2NC cross X. So you should think of the 2NC cross X as you are basically trying to make your 2AR. You're trying to make your 2AR. So think of it this way. When you answer a state's counter plan, all right, there should be five, seven answers on it. Maybe there's two solvency deficits. Maybe there's a permutation. Maybe there's a turn, okay? But the 1AR should kind of um, narrow it down to three or four of those arguments. Um, you always go bigger and then you go smaller. So the same thing with off case, you know, you start with five off, seven off, the block goes to three, the 2NR goes to one, or the 2NR goes to two. The same thing is true for affirmative arguments. So what you should be doing in 2AC cross X is basically making arguments for the key argument you want to go for in the 2AR. So that could be the permutation and you're, you know, attacking their perm evidence. You know, maybe it's a critique and they read three DAs from the permutation and you want to go for the permutation. You attack each of their perm cards in the 2NC. And you do that by highlighting evidence and comparing it, you know, is this really specific about our affirmative? Is this really specific to the situation? And then outline key flaws in the neg block. Now, I said, you shouldn't dunk on people in the 1AC. Um, that's not, it's not useful. I think it's a good idea in the 2NC. I think it's uh, in 2NC cross X because you don't have a lot of time in the 1AR. So if you can quickly eliminate some dumb argument made in the 2NC, that's super, super beneficial for your 1A because they can quickly make that argument and then move on. And the judge will have a good understanding of what happened because you know everybody pays attention to dunks. Sometimes they roll their eyes at them. You know If it's a question about nuclear war and it being empirically denied, yes. But if you're destroying somebody in a cross-examination, that can be hugely, hugely, hugely beneficial. Now for the 2N, okay, a lot of times, um, the 2NC is just trying to stay alive because your worst position to defend in cross-ex is in the 1NR, right? A lot of times a politics disadvantage can't survive three minutes of a 2NC cross-ex, which is why the politics disadvantage will be in the 1NR. Um, maybe that's the same thing for an impact turn, topicality, what have you. A lot of times you're just trying to survive and you're just trying to make sure that you can your position makes it through the 2NC. The other thing you want to be thinking about, okay, is what argument is the affirmative focusing in on? So like if they're asking you three, four questions about the solvency of your counter plan, okay, that is I, I, it can be a clue that the 1AR is going to go deep on solvency or deep on the perm or deep, deep on link defense. And that's something you can think about and focus in on during 1AR prep. 
you should always be prepping and cr during cross X if you're not giving it during your opponent's prep. And you can take a mental note and then prepare for it during one AR prep um, because you can kind of guess that they're going to be doing that. A lot of it's guesswork, but as you kind of realize the strategy that people put into cross X, it can help out a lot. So um, those are the kind of tips for individual cross examinations. I've got a few kind of general tips and then I'll end the record and then we'll have a Q&A. So um, one thing you should think about, and this is something that I wish people would talk about more, is um, the judge when it comes to cross-examination, okay? So this is from me as a judge perspective, all right? And I'm talking um, from judges writ large, you know, some judges are different. I, for example, um, I flow cross-examination because my memory is really bad. So if there's five questions in a 1AC cross-ex, I typically don't remember that an hour and a half later. Maybe I'll remember it um, if it gets like um, recommended over and over again, if it makes it into numerous cross-examinations or into speeches. But I can't remember the last time I remembered every single cross-ex question that was done. It's just not, my memory's not that great. So I flow cross-ex. Um, but a lot of judges don't, okay? Judges are old people. They don't get the adrenaline from um, debating. So a lot of times, um, you know, they're flowing for eight minutes and then they are mentally exhausted from flowing all of that. So a lot of times cross-examination is kind of like a break for them. So they're not paying attention to every single detail of the cross-examination. Because of that, okay, there are a lot of judges that snooze on cross X. Ethos is extremely important. Trying to go for the kill, trying to um, be as personable as possible, to take out things. That's very, very important to bring your judge in to be extremely entertaining um, because sometimes when that doesn't happen, a judge would um, not be paying attention and then you're not getting the benefit that you would typically want, okay? So with that being the case, okay, um, because most judges don't flow um, cross X, I, I should have wrote cross X there, okay? One thing you can do, one trick you can do is this. You can direct their eyes though, all right? So think about it from this perspective. When you're, when you're debating, right? You have, um, you know, virtually, you have your Zoom up, you have your speech doc up, and then you have your cards, and then you have your opponent's cards, right? For the judge, um, they have their ballots, they have Zoom, they have their flow, maybe it's on a computer, maybe it's on paper, and then they have your EV. So even though, you know, a judge might not remember everything that's said in a cross-examination, you can control where their eyes go to a large extent. So for example, if you're absolutely demolishing or going deep on a card, um, highlight where that card is. So like, um, all right, let's talk about this link evidence in the politics DA. And then judges, depending on the judge, will open up that doc, will open up that card and kind of look at it as you're going along. So you can do that late level com evidence comparison that a judge would do or a 2 r or 2AR does. You can do that in cross-examination and kind of guide where their eyes go. So it's not just, you know, where the arguments line up on a flow. It's also the judge's time and where their energy is focused. You can, you can direct that. So that's one thing you can do when um, you are in a cross-examination and one benefit of evidence comparison. The second thing is you should remind judges in speeches. So if you establish competition for a counter plan, that should be in the 2NC, you know? 1AC cross X clearly stated that we are able to have competition to the state's counter plan, this court's counter plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, all right, the cross-examination for the judge should be used for warrants. Warrants, warrants, warrants. When judges are flowing, you know, you're all talking at Mach 5, judges will get the tags. Um, sometimes people will get warrants, but a lot of times the warrants that come out, right, your certainty key arguments, that's on your advantage, your um, brink argument that's on your advantage for a, a specific argument, or your argument that answers circumvention that's in your solvency 
component. A lot of times those specific warrants will not come out in the 1AC um, due to just how quickly people speak. So use cross-examination to also explain the warrants from your evidence. Does your K-Link make a couple empirical stories, a couple empirical analysis of the history of water protections that can be drawn out in this cross-examination? So those things help you and help you build the 2NR, they help you build the 2AR so that a judge is quickly able to analyze that and able to quickly vote in your favor instead of being stuck looking at cards for 15 minutes and then figuring it out for themselves. So that is an extremely important thing to think about when um, you're talking about the judge. And then lastly, a plea for me and all the judges, I um, pulled them all and a couple, a couple last minute pleas um, one, resist the urge to dunk. Okay. Two, and I, um, I'm going to stress this a bunch. All right. I think this might be my biggest pet peeve. Um, don't stay too long when you've won something. Okay. Um, I see in a lot of times an, a person that's ineffective at cross X will spend a minute, 30, two minutes asking the same exact question once they've gotten an answer or once they haven't. A lot of times, if your opponent's not giving you an answer, they're not going to give it to you after minute one. So move on. So, you know, just trust the judge will understand, oh, my opponent's not answering this. And then make an argument about why that's, in, why that's important. That can be a vagueness argument. That can be a spec argument. Um, that certainly, you know, people will vote on that. I mean, a team literally won the um, Catholic National Forensics Final one of like the big nationals, they literally won on vagueness based off a cross-examination question that happened. They beat like a team that was completely out. They, they were completely outmatched and they destroyed a team on vagueness because of that. All right. Um, another thing, a plea from all judges, including myself, don't point out an argument is dropped because then they'll pick it up. Um, you know, just trust your flow. And then lastly, um, even though I'm not a fan of it, um, you know, you shouldn't ask flow questions like what was that number, that was the number three argument you made, but there are exceptions sometimes, you know, if you don't have it, you should, you should definitely ask it, but you should not be like, one of the things that destroys speaker points is what cards did you read in this card doc? Um, did you read this card? Where did you, what line did you stop? Blah, 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 blah. All of those completely destroy the flow of a debate and really affect the ethos of, um, debaters because it shows that you're having difficulty flowing and then that can you know factor in on where you line up and, and speaker points so it, it does matter a lot so with that being the case all right um we are going i'm gonna um stop my share and i'm gonna hit pause i'm gonna hit um pause on the recording and then we'll open up to the q a section of this okay <laughs>